good. So welcome to another of the ongoing program of Insider Outsiders online events. Um, some of you will, I think, know a lot about the project, others perhaps not. So you'll forgive me if I say a few words by way of introduction. My name is Monica Bomducci, and I'm the founding director of the Insiders Outsiders project that started off as a person-to-person -person nationwide year-long arts festival from March 2019 through to March 2020, designed to look at in a detailed, nuanced and indeed quite critical analytical way. It's something that was often commented on en passant, namely the huge, pervasive and you know, immense contribution made by refugees from Nazi-dominated Europe to this country, to British culture. Um, then came COVID. Luckily, the festival had pretty much run its course. And as many of you will know, I initiated an as I say, an ongoing programme of online events, of which this is clearly one. Uh, I will say straight away that Simon Lake, who is one of our lovely speakers tonight, contributed an essay to the companion volume to Insiders Outsiders, specifically looking at visual culture on the fascinating history of the Leicester Museum and Art Gallery collection of wonderful world-class collection of German Expressionist art, which of course is part of the focus of today's uh, today's session. So um, if you're interested, the book is still available with the same title, Insiders Outsiders, published by London Humphreys. It's even available at a discount on our uh, on the homepage of our website. Uh, and then we have Andrea, who I've known also for quite a few years. And I'm really, really looking forward to what Andrea has to say, because for a long time, ever since I heard about this euphemistically titled, shall we say, Exhibition Mid-European Art, 1944, Leicester, which was, as I think you already are aware, an extraordinarily rich compilation of the art condemned and destroyed indeed by the Nazis as degenerate in Tartata. I wondered, hold on, you know, how, how did this happen? <laughs> and uh, for a long time, Andrea's been working on this. Simon's certainly very interested too. And I, for one, am very much looking forward to hear about the fruits of Andrea's researches into this interesting exhibition. And also looking forward to hearing Simon putting the exhibition in the broader context of the art gallery and its history. The Hess family, Trevor Thomas, we'll be hearing more about all of them. So I think without further ado, and I must let in the, the latecomers, I'd like to hand over to Andrea, but not before saying just a few words about both of them, if I, if I may. Andrea's going to start the ball rolling. She's then going to hand over to Simon, and then Simon's going to hand back to her, and hopefully we'll have plenty of time for discussion afterwards. So Andrea's um, currently in Brussels. She's an art historian and anthropologist of some 20 years experience, uh, particularly as a provenance researcher. Uh, she's currently researcher, senior researcher and associate director in the restitution department at Christie's. And prior to Christie's, she worked for the Commission for Looted Art in Europe. Simon is eminently well qualified to talk about the Leicester context because for many years until 2019, he was the all-knowing, tremendously knowledgeable um, curator of fine art at Leicester Arts and Museum Service, in other words, the Art Gallery, which is home to the German Expressionist collection. Uh, he went freelance after that and um, has worked on a number of related art historical themes. I've mentioned his essay for my anthology and indeed gave a talk not so very long ago also, which is currently on the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel. I should just also mention, and then I will hand over to Andrea, I promise you, a fascinating book that Simon wrote in 2020 called The Painter's Hidden Masterpiece, which is a true story of a very little known Bavarian realist painter, somebody called Johannes Matthäus Kultz, part of whose triptych is actually in the Leicester Gallery, and I don't suppose we'll have time to hear much about that, but do do check that out. It's a fascinating story, well treated indeed by, by Simon. So enough from me, Andrea, over to you. Um, hello, uh, can you hear me, first of all? Yes, all, all, all okay. good. Um, so thank you very much, Monica, for the opportunity to speak as part of the Insiders Outsiders series. And I'm also very grateful to Simon for agreeing to contribute to today's talk. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, it's a very brief introduction. Uh, 2024 is the 80th anniversary of the Mid-European Art Exhibition, which, um, as we've already heard, took place at the Leicester Museum and Art Gallery from the 5th to the 27th of February, 1944. So 24 days. Um, and very briefly, I first started searching for images of works from the exhibition as a part-time research volunteer for the Leicester Museum and Art Gallery in 2012. <laughs> um, so it's a while ago. Um, and I was at the time reporting to Simon Lake, who was curator of fine art at the museum. Um, and I will, I could say some other things, but I will, 
Basically, it was an exhibition of German and Austrian avant-garde art in Great Britain during the Second World War. And um, as Simon will describe, it was a result of a meeting and meeting of minds of a collector's family from Erfurt who had found refuge in Great Britain, Tekla and Hans Hess, and a visionary curator, Trevor Thomas. Um, I will now pass over uh, to Simon, who will uh, explain the context. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Andrea, and thank you to Monica for the invitation to uh, join with you uh, to speak uh, this evening. Um, on the 1944 Mid-European Art Exhibition, um, in this, it's 80th anniversary year, so a, a fine marking of that show. Um, as has been said, for a number of years, uh, I was the curator of art in the Leicester Museum and Art Gallery, founded in 1848. Leicester now has an internationally acclaimed collection of early 20th century German art, particularly rich in German Expressionism, including artworks by Franz Marc, Kandinsky, uh, Kirchner, Kit Kollwitz, Max Pechstein, Gabriela Munter, and many others. Although not the first exhibition in Britain to show German Expressionist art, the Mid-European Art Exhibition of 1944, on which we're focusing, was one of the first major shows of important German Expressionist works in a British provincial museum. From the 1920s and 1930s, Leicester had embarked on a process of raising awareness of the importance of modern art, a major step being the 1936 Contemporary Art Exhibition organized by then art assistant, Arthur Suter. Uh, Suter had succeeded in securing loans of works by artists including Kandinsky, Dali, Max Ernst, Henry Moore, Pasmore, Picasso and Laszlo moholy nagy and loans coming from public and private collections and from the artists themselves. The local press reaction was positive. Um, the Leicester Mercury uh, enthusing, this is not a museum, it is a voyage of adventure. The pictures by Kandinsky are particularly interesting. The Second World War saw the museum experience new cultural initiatives and the auspicious arrival of key figures. A series of extraordinary serendipitous events would become catalysts for the foundation of Leicester's German art collection. The first of these was the arrival of Trevor Thomas, born in Wales 1907, a gifted and dynamic young curator who became the curator director of the museum between 1940 and 1946. Formerly curator of ethnography and shipping at Liverpool Museums, the young Welshman had visited America in 1938-39 via a Rockefeller scholarship, studying new innovations in museum exhibition and display. He also visited an exhibition on the Bauhaus uh, curated by uh, Alfred Barr Jr. at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It was this visit that fired in Thomas a deep interest in European and most importantly, uh, German modern art. Back home, uh, Thomas persuaded the, uh, the British authorities not to requisition the Leicester Museum for the war effort, instead uh, devising a series of exhibitions which offered cultural uh, offerings of a, of a different kind. There were children's activity clubs. Uh, there was the first season of lunchtime concerts to begin in 1942, and exhibitions of touring art funded by SEMA, the Council for the Encouragement of Music and the Arts, included a joint show of work by Henry Moore, John Piper and Graham Sutherland. And the next image, please. Uh, a second important arrival among many Jewish refugees to come to the city was Frau Tekla Hess, née Pauson, uh, born 1884 and uh, to 1968. Tekla Hess was the widow of the wealthy German Jewish industrialist and renowned art collector Alfred Hess, born 1879 to 1931, of Erfurt, Germany. The Hess collection had been celebrated as the finest contemporary art collection in 1920s Germany. Alfred and Tekla Hess's home was filled with vibrant expressionist canvases and had hosted visitors including Otto Dix, Eric Heckel, Nolder, Vasily Kandinsky, Franz Marc, Charlie Chaplin, 
and the playwright Bertolt Brecht and the singer Lottie Lenya. With Alf Alfred's unexpected death in 1931, aged just 52, the triumph of the Nazis and the subsequent forced sale of the Hess factories, the family fortunes catastrophically changed. Tekla's son Hans lost his publishing job in Berlin and fled abroad in 1933. Tekla bravely stayed behind, salvaging several German expressionist and related artworks from the family collection. Some sent abroad as loans, others placed for safekeeping with galleries, collectors and other individuals. Tekla would eventually arrive firstly in London in 1938, joining Hans, and they were reunited shortly afterwards with a significant consignment of Hess artworks that Tekla had successfully spirited out of Germany. Having worked in publishing, Hans Hess in London became heavily involved in producing publications that aimed to expose the true nature of life in Nazi Germany. He was also a founder member in March 1939 of the Free German League of Culture. Based in London, the League brought together anti-Nazi German and Austrian emigres with the aim of promoting political and cultural activities that could show an alternative to the Germany of the Third Reich. Nevertheless, soon after war broke out, he was one of thousands of non-British citizens suddenly designated enemy aliens, arrested and placed in hastily built internment camps. Many internees were sent even further away to the dominions of Australia and in Hans' case, Canada. In 1941, the British Parliament realised they'd taken a very hasty and precipitate decision and began to recall uh, the legislation recalling the internees on one condition that they worked for the authorities for the British war effort. This involved joining the Alien Pioneer Corps and it was mostly labouring jobs, clearing bomb damage, guarding munitions and, and other tasks that uh, the army didn't have time to do. Um, Hans was released uh, sometime in early 1942, returning to England, and he was given farm labouring work uh, on a farm in Loughborough, just outside Leicester. Tekla Hess moved shortly afterwards to Leicester, uh, renting accommodation to be near her son. All this was a far cry from the former glamorous life they had known. The meeting of Tekla Hess and Trevor Thomas at the museum. It is believed that Trevor Thomas and Tekla Hess first met around 1943, possibly during one of the lunchtime concerts held at the museum. It is certain that Thomas would have recognized the Hess name and the reputation of the family's famous art collection. For Tekla, she had found a new and unexpected ally and friend. Thomas then approached the museum's committee to report his meeting with Tekla and proposed an exhibition to include important examples of German Expressionist artworks to be held at the museum. The committee agreed to cover transport and storage costs of the Hess artworks now in London, seen as key to the show's success. A document, the Leicester List, was compiled offering a first record of some of the fine works which had arrived in Leicester. Next image, please. This is uh, uh, the cover of the, uh, the Mid-European Art Exhibition um, catalogue. We say catalogue, but in fact, for, with wartime restrictions on paper, it's a very small uh, document, uh, just, just above, uh, just, or just, should I say, just below, a4 size, a fold-out leaflet, in fact, a pamphlet. Um, the exhibition was carefully titled Mid-European Art, Not German, Acknowledging uh, Wartime Sensitivities. Thomas had successfully petitioned the Ministry of Labour to allow Hans Hess to be released from farm labouring in January 1944 to become art assistant at the museum. Offering help and support in this way was inherent in Thomas's nature and he'd previously helped other refugee artists who'd made a home in Leicester with small funds for paints and canvases. Together, Thomas, with Hans' support and Tekla's encouragement, selected the works to be hung. The organisation and presentation of the exhibition was credited to the Free German League of Culture, with Leicester becoming an honorary branch in time for the exhibition. Over 60 artworks, the majority from the Hess collection, were included in the final exhibition 
which took place, as Andrew has said, from the Leicester, at the Leicester Museum and Art Gallery from February the 5th to the 27th, 1944. Although uncredited, the foreword was probably written by museum curator Trevor Thomas and was unequivocal and searing of the situation in Germany. It's worth reading it in full. Of all the trends in modern painting, the least known to the English public are those of the mid-European countries. Early in the century, artists like Liebermann and Lesser Uri were influenced by the French Impressionists. The later trend, usually termed Expressionism, had its first exponents in the Scandinavian Munk, the Czech Kokoschka, the German Franz Marc of the Blue Rider Group, Pechstein, Nolde and Heckel of the Bridge Group, and independents like Hofer and Rolfs. Feininger, an American, Clay, a Swiss, and Kandinsky, a Russian, of the Bauhaus, the first truly modern school of organized building, painting, and craftsmanship, made an entirely new approach to the question of color, plane, and line, developing in the process cubist and abstract conceptions. It was before and after the last war that these attempts to find new forms of artistic expression were being made. The instability of the period is reflected in the paintings. The efforts to find new ways are bold, not always successful, but always courageous. The development was never completed. The rise of Hitlerism destroyed the schools and the spirit, exiled and suppressed the men in their works. Modern art was persecuted. Here, we can only show and judge what was attempted before this catastrophe overtook the creative spirit of a continent. We wish to thank all those who have loaned their pictures and in the first place have rescued them from certain destruction. This exhibition was highly unusual and one of the very first in English regions to show the work of German expressionist artists. The 20th century German art exhibition, the 1938 London Riposte to the 1937 Degenerate Art Exhibition in Germany had been a significant early milestone. Visitors to the Leicester show now, now encountered stunning oil paintings such as Franz Marc's Rote Frau or Red Woman and the large impressive triptych by Max Pechstein, the Bay at Monte Rosso from 1917, now in the collection of the St. Louis Art Museum, USA. There were etchings, prints and watercolours by Franz Marc, of which more from Andrea, um, Vasily Kandinsky, Karl schmidt rotloff Eric Heckel and Christian Rolfs. There were four oil paintings, um, Ships by Lionel Feininger, Yellow Houses and the Drain, both 1919, and the 1916 Canvas the Square, or Behind the Church. Thanks to Thomas's in instigation, persuasion, and the support of the Museums Committee, four key works were acquired from the exhibition for the Leicester Collection. The first of these was Red Woman, or Rote Frau, uh, painted in 1912 by Franz Marc. Purchased by the Museums Committee for £350 uh, by Stefan Pausen, uh, then living in Glasgow, brother of Tekla Hess, who had also successfully reached England a month before Tekla, helped by a letter vouching for his services from a Wigan basket weaver. The Pausens themselves were basket weavers from the town of Lichtenfels, Germany. The painting, a rare figure study for Mark, shows uh, a nude female in an abstracted paradisical landscape, uh, raising her arm and hand as if beckoning to the fecund and powerful nature of the swirling landscape around her. Her body is a deep red, symbolic for Mark of the earth and sensuality. Mark believed in the symbolic power of color, its great strength and an ability for animals in particular to see through the veil from reality to a world beyond. Mark was tragically killed in the First World War and with his death uh, silenced one of the greatest voices of German Expressionism. The next painting is Behind the Church or the Square, 1916 by Lionel Feininger. An elegant orchestration of forms de depicting Feininger's vision of the square in Weimar, uh, the large black shadows, the buttresses of the church, 
and wonderful uh, angular shafts of light coming in from the right, illuminating the tiny figures below. Next image is uh, a watercolour and gouache from uh, circa 1910 by uh, Emil Nolder, uh, called The Mask or Head with Red Black Hair. Nolder was uh, a taciturn um, painter living on the island of Alsen, but the Brooker artists invited him to join their group um, as they were in awe of what they called his violent colour storms. Um, also, this powerful mask-like figure echoes the inspiration that the artists had found in uh, non-Western cultures and the ethnography at the, uh, the Dresden uh, Museum of Art. Both this work and the finding it were purchased in February 1944 by the museum's committee for a, a total of £150. Finally, uh, the fourth work is View from My Window or the Bridge at Erfurt in 1919, painted by Max Peckstein in uh, April 1919 during a visit to uh, the Hess family, where he was warmly welcomed, had a tour of the factories, enjoyed hospitality in the garden, played tennis, and produced a wonderful woodcut of Alfred Hess uh, using paper used for wrapping uh, the shoes that the family manufactured. The sales of uh, these works and the, their acquisition for Leicester provided much needed income for Tekla and Hans, um, and in particular uh, for Hans newly married and with a child on the way, the exhibition proved to change the whole course of his life. He had met his future wife, Lily Williams, like him a German emigre, while working as a volunteer for the English Refugee Committee. Lily and Hans married in 1944 and their daughter was born the same year. Working with a skeleton staff in wartime, Trevor Thomas had produced a groundbreaking show, secured key acquisitions for the museum collection and set in motion the beginnings of a great collection. Sadly for Thomas, however, he suffered a terrible, terrible injustice. An almost certainly trumped up charge linked to a supposed homosexual indiscretion. He appeared before a magistrate at a time when being openly gay would end your career. Pressured to plead guilty, his employment was tragically terminated in September 1946. He would later successfully lecture in America, also working for UNESCO, and just before his death was rightly welcomed back to the Leicester Museum in the 1980s by then director Patrick Boylan. Next slide, please. This is an image of Hans in later life. He left Leicester in 1947, accompanied by Tekla, and moved to York to take up a new position as keeper of the City Art Gallery. He spent the next 20 years at York, both as curator and director of the York Festival. His authoritative monographs on Lionel Feininger, 1960, and George Gross, 1975, the year of his death, uh, remain key reference works. And uh, last image in my section. This is Eric Heckel, uh, a landscape watercolour Marseille from 1926. During their time at uh, Leicester, Tekla and Hans had made a number of new friendships and gained new supporters. Mr. Harold Goddard, a member of the Goddard family of chemists in Leicester, had purchased this watercolour landscape by Heckel uh, from Tekla Hess. It had been shown in the 1944 Mid-European Art uh, Exhibition. Uh, he would later present it to the museum in 1956. Many years later, Mrs. Lisa Simon presented 1912 etching by Eric Heckel, young woman with a high hat, uh, to the museum. Her emigre family had come to uh, Leicester again in the 1930s and befriended Tekla a little later. Um, her husband and her both were involved with the Cascaloid uh, factory uh, of man plastics manufacturing in Leicester. So in conclusion, the Leicester collection of early 20th century German art with its foundation built on this wonderful um, exhibition uh, continued to expand in successive decades and uh, an eighth set of the artists presently in the collection and its history can be seen at www.germanexpressionismleicester.org. And so I now pass back to Andrea. Thank you. Thank you. Um... 
Thank you very much for Simon for this amazing introduction, very evocative and informative. And um, I'm going to go to my first slide, which I accidentally showed <laughs> just now. Sorry. Um, okay. So as this slide shows, this is um, this is a report of a work in progress. So uh, I called it a workshop report, um, as there are still images to be identified. <laughs> um, and the plan is to hopefully to publish some further information later in the year or in the coming months um, to be confirmed. Uh, I'm just gonna go, right. So um, why attempt to reconstruct an exhibition? So what's the purpose? Uh, what are the reasons for attempting to do so? Um, in this case, as Simon has explained, accompanied by a small catalog or rather an exhibition leaflet or pamphlet, um, due to paper shortage uh, during the war, um, which listed 62 works of art. Um, the catalogue includes few descriptive details, no dimensions, no images. I mean, images, uh, it's not unusual for catalogues at that time to have no images. Um, and so why attempt to find images for these works um, and possibly to recreate the exhibition? Um, just Right. So um, this is just to show, um, as research has been progressing, it has been amazing to see the rather dry catalog descriptions burst into color or into expressive lines with each image found, and as, as illustrated by this collage, <laughs> um, and then to be able to see them in dialogue with each other to visualize how these artworks um, may have been displayed uh, together in 1944. Um, this is not a complete, it's not all the artworks, it's just a selection. And it's just um, to give an impression of how, um, you know, you see those kind of quite scant descriptions and then you suddenly, um, it's kind of a little bit bowled over <laughs> um, by actually seeing the works themselves. Um, and another aim is to um, trace um, a key motivation of that um, is, to enhance the memory and documentation and visibility of the exhibition by locating images in um, of the artworks and tracing the artworks, both for research and for education. Um, another aim is to trace the trajectory of the artworks. How did they come to Leicester? We do know this uh, for, for the Hess collection, but not as yet for uh, other lenders. And what paths did they take after 1944? And where are the artworks today? Um, uh, through tracing the trajectories of the artworks, um, we can also document the lenders of the exhibition to the exhibition, other, you know, in addition to the Hess family, research professional networks and social circles of the era um, in the art world um, in Great Britain and internationally. Um, and this can also contribute to the history of emigre and refugee circles and networks, and can also contribute to the history of the reception of German and Austrian avant-garde in Great Britain in those decades. Um, so the focus has been on finding and confirming images uh, up to now. Um, this has gone hand in hand with documenting basic provenance information for the works, adding information as it has been found, um, with additional provenance uh, literature exhibitions to be added further down the line. Um, to kind of like to try and keep the focus on finding and confirming images. Um, and as mentioned above, tracing the paths that works have taken after 44 can help illuminate professional networks and social circles. Um, so to go to the catalog, to the exhibition and the catalog leaflet, um, as, can, as you can see here, you can see all 62 works. The exhibition included a total of 62 works, of which were 11 paintings, 26 works on paper other than prints, and 25 prints. And as Simon had mentioned, of the 62 works, four plus one, <laughs> um, so five in total, are today part of the collection of the Leicester Museum, an art gallery in around eight are on loan to the museum, at least eight, to my knowledge. Um, and so there are 49 works for which images needed to be found. Around half of these have either been identified, um, um, I include in this group works requiring some further research to con fully confirm the match, um, and as of today, 25 images remain to be identified. The majority of those that still need identification are from the group of works by lenders 
who have not yet been identified by me anyway. <laughs> Um, for some works in this group, uh, possible candidates have been identified, but there is too little information at this stage to be able to confirm. So I've included them under, still need to be identified. Um, so these are my current research focus, and I hope to be in a position, as I mentioned, to share new information on these in the coming months. Um, to briefly touch on methodology, just go back here. Um, <clears throat> so there are three main lender groups. Uh, first is the Hess Collection, so 47 works um, in the exhibition come from the Hess Collection to current knowledge. And then there are other lenders to be confirmed in some cases. Um, and then <clears throat> thirdly, <clears throat> excuse me, there are artists. Uh, so Fred Ullmann uh, contributed two works to the exhibition and Kokoschka. However, in Kokoschka's case, photograph one work, he's represented by one work in the exhibition, is a loan directly from the artist or if it came from a private collector. Um, the main challenge is the lack of detail in the 1944 catalogue, so there are no measurements, and for some of the works no date is recorded, and of course there are tidal variations over time and different sources, um, uh, as we know. Um, the research has also shown that the date and possibly medium recorded in the exhibition leaflet can on occasion be inaccurate. Um, so sometimes it's one has to be a bit, uh, well, just be aware of that. And um, for works from the Hess collection, which is why the focus was initially on Hess, um, one of the main reasons, uh, among many others, of course, um, was knowing that, pro that knowing the Hess provenance has made it possible to identify and confirm images. So you could go via the artwork, but you could also confirm a match by finding references to the Hess family, which was incredibly helpful. Um, for example, this is one example, um, I compared the 1944 catalog leaflet with the catalog for the 1953 exhibition of works from the Hess collection at the York City Art Gallery. This is the one on the left. And this added measurements and descriptive detail for quite a few of the works. Um, and then also um, on the right is also compared to an exhibition that took place in Leicester in 1988-89 um, on the 45th anniversary of the um, Mid-European Art Exhibition. And again, um, that could also help. Uh, sometimes you would find works again that were in 44, in 53, and in, in the 88 exhibition. Um, and all of this is just to, that was one of the main routes to try to um, add detail to help identification from further research. Um, for following that cross-referencing exercise, the first one, my first step with any work was to consult the artist's catalog resume. Um, and for prints, I focused on finding the correct image, leaving aside for now the identification of the actual print exhibited in 1944, where this could not uh, be identified immediately or you know straightforwardly. As Hess collection stamps were added to the reverse of the sheets from the Hess collection, this can help confirm in future if a particular work has Hess provenance. And the focus was on British sources, but also um, consulting international sources, including in Germany and Switzerland, and for example, uh, pre-1931 exhibitions for added descriptive detail here and there. Swiss archives, because as is known, Tekla Hess was for a time able to deposit or exhibit and exhibit part of the collection um, in Basel and then Zurich. Mm. A checking relevant UK exhibitions from the from 45 to the 1980s proved fruitful. For example, among many arts council exhibitions on Feininger and Rolfs, then there was a very important exhibition in 1950 of expressionist works in the St. George's Gallery, um, and then in 1952 at, at Roland and Browse in Del Banco. Um, and another key source, I'm just going to show an example, were auction catalogues. Um, for example, as Many will know uh, the works from the Hess collection were sold. Many of uh, quite a few works from the Hess collection were sold via the Ketro Auction House in Stuttgart, and also Kornfeld and Klipstein, among others. And um, a systematic review of their sales catalogs is ongoing, but it has already 
um, yielded many images, descriptions, and additional provenance. So this is the work Pine Martens, the lithograph by Franz Mark, which in 1944 was um, number 45 in the catalog. Then you see it here in the city of York, where it's number 56, and you can, it added, that's the, the measurements. Um, and then in 56, it was sold via Ketterer. And here's the reference, Sammlung Alfred Hess Erfurt. Just to illustrate how you have on one side the description of the artwork, on the other hand, just to, I, I think I didn't mention it, I'm sorry, that the 53 exhibition was an exhibition drawn from the Hess collection. Um, and then you have again, Ketra sale where it mentions Alfred Hess Airport. So we can be pre pretty certain that this is the one um, that was shown in 44. And also another interesting fact is that um, this lithograph was also among the group of works considered for acquisition in Leicester, but then in the end not acquired. Um, so I have to find my text again. Um, other resources are uh, very important sources are correspondence of Hess family members in a variety of archives, including of artists, art dealers, museum staff, um, archives of members of the circles or contacts of the Hess family and of Trevor Thomas, for example, museum archives, um, art dealer and auction house records, artist papers, for example, Feininger and um, Another important resource will be also the Free League of German Culture, so records relating to this, or rather diaries, memoirs, and so on. Then also artist monographs and photo archives, not to forget those, and very important sources. Um, just quickly to brief, uh, I will focus, um, sorry, <laughs> I should have showed you this before. This is some selected works that were sold through Ketera in the 50s and 60s. Um, was, just to show which ones they are. Müller, and then this is Macke, Franz Mark, and these are the Pine Martins again. So here, these are selected finding our works um, in the 1944 exhibition. Um, and here you have, I've underlined or sort of framed in blue the one, the works that, again, it's just a selection, not all of them, but um, the ones framed in blue are the ones in Leicester today. On the left, of course, as Simon had described, is acquisition from 1944. And on the lower right, it's a, on loan um, to the museum. And and here it's just, um, sorry, it's not very good illustration, but <laughs> it's, it's just wonderful to see uh, all those images again. Um, and of course, it's more straightforward in many cases to identify paintings rather than works on paper um, that can present different challenges. Um, so it's been wonderful to be able to see the images almost emerge from the exhibition leaflet to view them side by side, um, as on the group of works by Lionel Feininger shown in this slide. This is only a selection, as I mentioned. And um, the Hess and Feininger families were close, and the two families visited one another, and they celebrated birthdays, and, and the Feininger uh, stayed also with the, family, with the Hess family in Erfurt, and they corresponded over several decades. And um, this correspondence also extended to um, in the in the fifties, then to uh, Hans and Lily Hess's daughter. Um, and in nineteen fifty nine, Hans Hess published the catalog resume of Lionel Feininger's paintings, and Hans Hess also promoted Feininger's work through exhibitions. These included, for example, in nineteen fifty one, an exhibition at the City of York Art Gallery, of which Hess was the director from nineteen forty eight. I think to 67, uh, 47, 48 to 67, and an Arts Council exhibition in the night in 1960. So, um, and in December 54, uh, Hans and Lily has his daughter wrote to Papi Leo, which was a, um, a nickname of, you know, a family name for Leonardo you know, Feininger, that Granny has three of your nicest pictures hanging on the walls. Um, and just to explain the, the, the plan, maybe or to show the plan, is maybe to go from this to then having an information sheet, so to speak, for each work. This is only basic provenance with selected exhibitions, selected literature. Um, here you have a sale from the um, Mason's papers at the Getty Research Institute, which confirmed that this picture was sold by Tekla Hess to Mason's um, in 51. Um, 
and again, this is also to illustrate how this can, you know, the tracing of the artworks can illustrate networks. For example, with Mason's um, Belgian art dealer, uh, you know, very promoter of the avant-garde, um, associated with the London Gallery for 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 many years, and then who, um, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> and um, who also sold a Chagall for the Hess collection uh, before before this uh, this finding out. And then you have the next, then uh, after Mason's, it goes to Eric Esterich, born in Brooklyn in 1913 into a family of Jewish emigres. He was a sociologist and a broadcaster. He was based in Britain in 1941 to 45, more or less. In 1947, he and his wife Salome Dessau settled in Great Britain. And as is well known in the late 40s and 50s, he built up a major collection of Italian avant-garde art became a full-time art dealer in 1960, founding the Grosvenor Gallery, Grosvenor Gallery and established the Eric and Salome Estrick Foundation. And he is in contact with Masons by 1951 regarding the loan of Severini to an exhibition organized by Masons in Belgium, which is the one that's listed here in Knoklo Zut, um, um, at which this painting was also shown. And then we learn that by 1958, Eric Astori acquired this painting by finding out. Um, then my next focus is on this beautiful picture. This is 1940. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> this is number 40. Sorry, I'm reading from my mobile. This is number 40 uh, from the 1944 catalog, White Elephants. Um, so this beautiful painting, The Dream by Franz Marc, uh, was included in the 1944 exhibition as catalogue number 40 under the title White Elephants. The painting is a testament to the friendship between the artist Franz Marc and the poet Elsa Lasker Schüler. Uh, they began exchanging letters in November 1912, meeting for the first time in December of that year. And their correspondence lasted until the artist uh, Franz Marc's death in 1916. <clears throat> Their letters and postcards are filled with watercolors, drawings, sketches, and poems. And throughout their correspondence, it's as though the artist and the poet, who was also a very gifted draughtswoman, inhabited a shared dream space, that, which is quite fitting with the title The Dream, um, uh, addressing each other by their alter ego, also and, and their alter egos, and uh, inspiring and bouncing ideas of each other. So in their playful correspondence, they created a poetic universe of words and images, which is a joy to behold. And in this painting, the dedication reads, Den Prinzen von Theben gewidmet von Franz Marc, so dedicated to the Prince of Thebes by Franz Marc. And the Prince of Thebes is Elsa Lasker Schüler. And I just included some quotes from their correspondence, how they address each other. And um, and here is a postcard, Franz Marc, as we know, drew a lot of postcards, wonderful postcards, including this one, which is of an elephant anyway. So this is just a theme uh, that was repeated um, in their, oh, sorry, in their exchanges. Uh, and so the um, this painting um, in early 1913, Franz Marc and his wife Maria asked their circle to donate artworks for an auction to benefit Azalaska Schüler, who was in financial difficulties following her divorce from Herbert Walden. Oh. Uh, the auction took place on the 17th of February 1913 at the Neue Kunstsalon in Munich, and Marc donated this painting to the auction, uh, which also included works by Yavlensky, Kandinsky, Kokoschka, Klee, Kubin, and the artists of the Brücke. Um, and today this painting is in the collection of the Art Museum in Bern. So, um, and it's just, I love this painting. <laughs> um, all right, so this is just um, to talk a little bit about other lenders. And so far I've, I've tried to focus on pictures where it's, it's confirmed <laughs> that uh, the match is confirmed. And here I'm sort of, a little bit on thin ice, but it was called a research uh, sort of workshop report. So here we go. This might all <laughs> turn out to be wrong, but this is a possible match for number 21 in the exhibition, 1944 exhibition, which, which was the Karl Hofer Woman with Plant. Um, and again, this is just lit a work in progress. So um, to be continued. Um, here it's basically a work with Walter Goldfeld provenance later Gore, 
um, and who also uh, was from well, lived in Berlin and then emigrated via London to Australia and then back to London. And he owned this work by he he loaned this work in 1928 to a major exhibition in Berlin, and he's again listed as the lender in in London in 1950. Um, and so there's that link to to the UK. Um, and uh, you know, Hofer painted many many paintings of this subject of a woman or a young woman with a plant or or flowers. Um, but um, I think this. Anyway, it's something I'm looking into right now, <laughs> um, and I'm quite intrigued by. It. So, um, another avenue is is also um, if you talk about if you're looking at the last group of works, so to speak, or the third group of works, which are by Ullmann and by Kokoschka. As we say, we don't know if the Kokoschka was actually loaned from him or from a private collection. Um, um, but these two names, especially also Ullmann, well, both of them actually link them to the Free um, League of German Culture. Um, so Ullmann was a lawyer and who became an artist, and he was a co-founder of the Free League of German Culture. It was, in fact, at his home, his home on 47 Downshire Hill that the artist section was founded of the, of the League. Um, apologies for the brevity on... on Talking about this um, uh, Free League of German Culture, I can refer to excellent publications by, for example, Anna Müller-Herlin or Michael Kreisier on this topic, um, and by uh, uh, Charmian Brinson and Richard Dove. Very briefly, the Free League of German Culture was founded in the late 1938-39 at the home of Ferdinand Diana Ullmann at 47 Downshire Hill, composed of several sections, writers, artists, musicians, actors, and scientists, and they later relocated officially to 36 Upper Park Road, um, and held a very active program of talks and small exhibitions were organized by the League. Uh, leading figures were John Hartfield and Oskar Kokoschka, uh, also Fred Ullmann and Heinz Warner, and Ullmann seems to have also been a figurehead for the artist section. Um, and this is just to, um, I think, exploring the this league and 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 possibly diaries and 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 just focusing on this network could also be quite fruitful. I think to maybe identify further uh, pictures loaned to the exhibition in 1944. So Hans Hess. Uh, it's a hypothesis, but um, Hans Hess shared a flat in London with Heinz Kamlitzer, who was a member of the Free League of German Culture. And as you can see here on the top left, sorry, this is just a snapshot of Upper Park Road, <laughs> um, which was the clubhouse uh, of the League. Um, and in February 1940, an exhibition of what is understood to have been works from the Hess collection was shown at the League's clubhouse and Upper Park Road. And as already mentioned by Simon earlier, the Leicester Museum Minutes referred to the Mid-European Art Exhibition in February 1944 as having been organized or arranged by the Leicester branch of the Free League of German Culture, i.e. Hans Hess, um, and the exhibition, uh, I mean, I, I think, <laughs> um, and the exhibition catalog and museum programming in Leicester also mentioned the Free League of German Culture as having arranged the exhibition. Um, and as noted by Müller Herlin, Oskar Kokoschka and um, Brinson and Dorf, Oskar Os Kokoschka reviewed the Leicester exhibition for the League's newsletter, which is the one on the right here. Um, and however, this is a quote um, from the chapter by Anna Miller Herlin on in Brinson those 2010 book Politics by Other Means about the um, League. However, although it was held under the patronage of the FGLC, the section was slight. Um, this is a quote. Um, this is relating to the 1944 exhibition. Apart from Kokoschka, the only other FGLC artist represented was Ullmann. And um, this is just a show program, programming, events program in Leicester, which shows that mid European art and then explains Free League, Free German League of Culture, Free League of German Culture, and that there was another exhibition by SEMA and at the same time. And the concerts, you know, as it illustrates what Simon had mentioned before about the events program and, and 
surrounding also exhibitions at that time. Um, that's it. Okay, so, sorry. Um, the outlook, um, well, it's very interesting to explore the overlapping circles, notably the Hess family um, members and, and um, including also the link to the organizers of the 20th century German art exhibition, the Burlington Galleries, um, which is described in Lucy Wasensteiner's book, uh, published in 2019, where there's, she also describes this link, uh, notably of this uh, watercolor on the bottom and the middle, the Macke. Um, and then there's also, I think, so I can't see it, but on the on the right here, there's a you can see an etching of three women. This is a Lehmbrock, uh, which I was uh, it was also included in thirty eight anyway. And there's an organizational link uh, where one of the co organizers is referred to by Tekla Hess in correspondence to Feininger, where she says that. Um, sorry, I just have to find the quote. <laughs> um, the Weidlerin, uh, I think uh, she means Charlotte Weidler, uh, that would have more information on her works or has, has some of her works. Um, so there's all lots to be explored further um, and lots of research avenues and Trevor, Trevor Thomas's circle. And these are all, I think you can see them sort of as overlapping circles. Um, and another quick example is on the lower right, this heckel. I'm thinking, this is not yet confirmed, but that this could be um, the heckel watercolor uh, boats, number 18, from 1912. This is also 1912. And this work was um, sold at, uh, at Christie's in the 90s uh, with the information that um, it was a wedding gift uh, to the consigner. So it's very intriguing. Um, and because of that link, I'm, 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 it's a, it's a, I think it's probable, but it's not yet confirmed that this is, is a match. Um, and then here you have again research possibility. This lithograph in the, oh, sorry, <laughs> in the off center um, of this locomotive, which I think could is a quite a probable match for number eight, the Greyhound. Um, which was a name uh, for a locomotive in the US at the time, and which is also, uh, I think, called a Windspiel by the Feiningers. And Hans Hess and Lily Hess's daughter, in a letter to Lionel Feininger, refers to the Windspiel from a little of 1906 in her room. So it's it's um just to explain how maybe, or to illustrate how um, correspondence can also be very, um, contain sort of nuggets of information um, that one has to follow up, of course. Um, so the outlook to wrap up, um, looking further into the prints, tracing as many of prints as possible, um, and to focus on loans by collectors other than the Hess family, while still looking for works from the Hess collection that have not yet been identified, and sort of it would be lovely to have, for example, an online exhibition to recreate this, as has been also, I think, already discussed, I know, in, in Leicester and um, by Simon and uh, by Monica. And, um, but this is, I wanted to finish on this slide, but this is the idea to kind of, in an online exhibition, you might have this catalog and then you might click on the artwork and then the image would appear with provenance or description and further information or not depends how, how how much detail you want to get into but um it's just this idea from a sort of dry kind of oh, terse kind of you know pay, page scant information to then um suddenly see all these colors and lines appear okay so thank you very much for your uh, attention Thank you so much, Andrea, and indeed Simon as well. That was, as I expected, hugely fascinating and tantalising as well, because clearly there is more work still to be done. Would you like to stop screen sharing, Andrea? And um, yes. I know it's we're it's almost seven o'clock, but I imagine there'll be some questions and comments. So obviously those who have to leave must leave, but uh, we can carry on for a little bit longer, I think. Good. Simon, good. Um, right. I had, let me just, there were one or two people who had to leave. Yes, leave early, but had some, hold on a second. Um, 
had some questions. Um, I have one very specific question, which I'm going to ask you, because you quite rightly mentioned the 1938 exhibition that Lucy Wassenstein has done mm -hmm. Sterling work research on at the Burlington Galleries, which is obviously a really important landmark cultural event for you know, the reception of German art in this country. But do you know anything about or have you just and or have you discovered any connection between what you've been researching and the 1934 um, exhibition at the Parsons Gallery in Oxford Street oh. of modern German art, which I think I'm right in saying was the very first of its kind, much smaller in scale, but actually really, you know, important and yet little researched at the moment as yet. Uh, the brief answer is I have I know, <laughs> but um, I can I would love that's a great. Uh, sorry that I missed that out, but um, that's a great. Is there a catalogue for this? Or there was again a very very sort of rudimentary catalogue, and yeah. I am actually I'd almost forgotten. I've been in touch with uh, Karl Braunschweig. He was called. He anglicised his name in due course, but his granddaughter, Joan Alvarez, started doing some research on that exhibition. Oh, anyway, again, there are kind of, you know, fascinating to see how more connections might be made. Um, okay, okay. Now, um, yes, so I'm just scrolling through. Would anybody, while I'm just looking at this, would anybody like to put a virtual hand up and ask a question or make a comment themselves? Straight, um, there's a lot of rich material there, isn't there? No? Okay. In the meantime, um, John Goodman had to leave early. Thanks for this fascinating talk. Uh, I think, actually, no, I'm the only one who can see the message. Yes, um, just wanted to alert the assembled company to the fact that actually not only did Hess become curator at York and obviously did some interesting things there, but he then went on to become a lecturer at the University of Sussex uh, in its very early days, where art history was certainly something very new for the, you know, British sort of so-called red brick universities. And I will, if I may, just at this point mention that I'm hatching a plan, as it were, with the Research Centre for German and Austrian Exile Studies at the University of London to do quite an ambitious project and a sort of a conference ending, sort of resulting in a yearbook in due course for the centre, looking at the reception and the experience of the emigre academics, which of course is a huge uh, topic, almost too big really for comfort. But what I think I'm probably going to try and do, and it'll be not this year, possibly not even next year, but in due course, is to actually do a series of talks on the emigre art historians, because of course that is a very fascinating topic in in itself. So Hess would certainly be part of that that story. Uh, let me just see, um, I'm just looking around if there are any raised hands there. Christian Weikop also, um, I think, actually, are you still with us, Christian? Or did you have to, um, I'm going to read this out because um, I'm not sure if it's come through to everybody. Um, Yes, no, Christian, um, a few, few, he says, a few oh, weeks yeah. ago, we celebrated the life and work of Shulamit Bear at the Courtauld Institute. And I have to say, I was there and it was an intensely moving, wonderful occasion. She died far too young. Uh, Shulamit was a great expert and Rosa Shapira, yeah. an important figure in the history of the Leicester collection of expressionism. What was Shapira's involvement, if any, in the mid-European uh, art exhibition? Let me ask that question first. Do we know of her involvement? Yes. Simon? <laughs> Simon, do you do? Not, uh, not directly. Um, I know that uh, she was she was instrumental in the um, the later the uh, uh, the bequest of uh, her work to the museum, but um, <clears throat> I, I'm not aware of her involvement. Of course, uh, she would have been known to the Hess family. I'm, I'm sure there's there's mm. there's no doubt about mm. that. Um, and may well have even visited or uh, perhaps have, have uh, made herself known to, um, if not visiting the home of the Hess family, then potentially other networking opportunities or gatherings or meetings at key exhibitions. Um, so I think that that's a possibility, um, but no direct documentation at the moment to indicate her involvement, to my knowledge, in the 1944 exhibition. Um, Christian continues, if I may, she says, um, yes, yeah, she fled Nazi Germany in the late 1930s, had visited the Hess uh, Villa in Erfurt on, in the 1920s on several occasions. But again, he's asking what was her connection to Trevor Thomas and co in the 1940s. Clearly, we don't know for sure. Peter Tomori, successor to Hans Hess, was instrumental in um, helping Shapira stage an important exhibition of Schmidt-Brotloff's work at Leicester in 1953 the same year as the York Expressionism show, but did she lend anything to this 1944 exhibition? 
Interesting, <laughs> intriguing, intriguing. I have to say, actually, before I go to the, come to the next question, I was also I sort of pricked up my ears. I, I noticed the mention of uh, L.T. Messens, who, of course, was also associated with mm. Roman Penrose and that whole avant-garde circle. Fascinating and the Hampstead connection. Another question, actually, again, to do with the F, the Free German League of Culture. Um, I was aware that they organised all sorts of activities in that Hampstead base, which incidentally, I think the house, after it moved from Fred Ullman's house, Fred and Diana Ullman's house in um, uh, Downshire Hill to Upper Park Road, I think I'm right in saying that actually they were given access to that house by somebody from the Church of England, which is kind of intriguing. And I can't help wondering if it's something to do with George Bell. That's this kind of hanging question that I'd be quite intrigued to know about anyway, that sort of by the way but are we are you aware of any other exhibitions in so-called provincial centers i.e outside london that the fglc was involved with because it's kind of interesting that i don't know uh, sorry i'm i'm no, i don't know um i'm i'm almost like i'm at the well i'm looking at the context and i'm expanding more and more into other sources like uh, um, how do you say correspondence archives and so on but I haven't um, I'm, I'm very much provenance researching <laughs> so um, that might um, I, I've, I've read the books and the articles on that are available on the league but um, I've, there's been several exhibitions mentioned in London in various venues um, but to my knowledge not outside of London but mm -hmm. I'm I, I can't really say at the moment. I'm sorry. Maybe Simon, yeah. sorry to throw this to you, Simon. <laughs> Maybe you know. Uh, well, I'm I'm thinking um, there there may be some some uh, avenues for exploration around the 19, 1951 uh, festival of Britain because I think uh, that yeah. in the regions there may have been individual responses. Now, whether there's anything preserved in the archives um, of regional museums, that's a possibility. Possibly also um, press articles. Um, I believe that uh, uh, Kurtz, who I wrote a, a book on, the, the, re the Bavarian realist painter Kurtz, who was an emigre to England, um, I believe was invited to show some works um, at a regional uh, exhibition, uh, which was instigated um, partly in response to the Festival of Britain um, uh, a local cultural offering um, in Stoke. Uh, I'm not certain whether he actually uh, completed the full exhibition, but I believe he sent uh, a quartet of works off uh, to that show. Um, possibly uh, artists and individuals who were active in the Free German League of Culture may well have um, uh, had some participation in the, the Festival of Britain through their artistic endeavours, um, either in the, the main, the principal festival, or possibly um, elsewhere in smaller exhibitions, satellite galleries and others. So that's that's worth further investigation, I, I think. Mm. And also the connection possibly with the Artist International Association, another possible connection yeah. let me let me yeah. just focus now on some of the questions coming in and, and comments uh, from penny lawton fascinating talk thank you both um i also pricked up my ears penny about this the mention of the warburg institute that exhibition on simultaneously portrait and character yes. what do yes. we know about the warburg connection um sorry sorry i was just finding mm -hmm. trying to find a piece of paper um uh all i know sorry i uh I found a program for this <laughs> exhibition or leaflet again, an exhibition catalog leaflet. If I'm not, yeah, I found it. Yes, sorry. I'm just so we can also share this. Uh, but um, this is part of the SEMA that maybe Simon will have more context about. You may, you mentioned it before in your introduction. Uh, this uh, it was an exhibition organized by the Warburg Institute for SEMA, which later became the Arts Council, mm -hmm. World Time Entertainment and Cultural Events. Um, I don't know enough about it. No, again, really tantant, sort of intriguing connections there. Yes, indeed. Um, a question from Annette Carruthers. I was interested in the reference to, is it Arthur or Alan Suter? What's the correct uh, surname? Who taught later in Manchester. Was he involved with the German Expressionist exhibition or collection? It's it's possible, I think. Um, um, again, various people who, who moved off to uh, other institutions, um, we hope would have maintained um, their connection to Leicester. Unfortunately, um, 
there's only uh, uh, minimal um, uh, documentation um, uh, around Arthur Suit, although there is preserved the the uh, the folio of correspondence um, uh, following his his efforts to secure artworks for the 1936 exhibition of contemporary art. So the wonderful letters from individual artists responding to his entreaties to uh, lend work to to that that show. I'm sure that um, he he would have uh, uh, followed developments in German expressionism and been been aware of of various galleries as as potential uh, feeders into um, the expansion of collections, certainly in Leicester and and further afield and during his tenure at Manchester. Ah, Kristen is still with us, um, commenting that Suter in fact wrote a number of articles for the Manchester Guardian after the war, promoting German art, including the schmidt Rotloff exhibition in 1953. So clearly a committed supporter of, yeah, indeed. And um, I wonder if I just briefly make, a, I think, quite an important, more general point. I mean, it's often said, I sort of trots off people's tongues, I think rather too glibly, that England in the interwar period, indeed immediately after the Second World War, was a bit of a provincial isolated, you know, slightly backward sort of place, culturally speaking, particularly in relation to the visual arts and particularly in relation to avant-garde German art. And clearly that's not quite the whole truth. I think, you know, Lucy made that evident in her research on the 1938 exhibition. Um, and, you know, some of the individuals, the homegrown, as it were, individuals like Trevor Thomas, of course, you know, prove that it's actually a much more complicated story. And one shouldn't make these dismissive and rather unnuanced sort of comments. OK, um, so perhaps just now to... to Finish off. I mean, a number of comments from people in the audience just saying what a fascinating talk, fascinating topic uh, this is. And uh, perhaps I can just read out what Julia Nunes or Nunes had, had to say. First of all, I would like to say this is an absolutely fascinating topic. Uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge. It would be a dream to recreate the content of the exhibition. That would be absolutely fantastic. One day we may well be, or maybe we will be lucky enough to visit an actual recreation of it. Well, who knows? I mean, Andrea, let me ask you, you said that you're going to, are you, are you planning to publish something fairly soon to reveal your research thus far? Uh, I, I would love to, yes, maybe a but bit you, later. You haven't, got, you haven't got anything sort of lined up just yet? Not nothing. Uh, no, no I think this is a hugely rich topic, which really oh, deserves you. further scrutiny. And obviously what you've been doing is absolutely invaluable. Let's keep in touch if anybody else in the audience has any thoughts or indeed any more information to contribute, but actually thoughts about how to make this happen. I mean, I think it would be absolutely wonderful. You know, it's not just the work itself, which is of world class excellence and merit, you know, but the whole context, the history, the the reception, et cetera, et cetera, because we haven't talked about the critical reception of the exhibition. Mm. Apart from that Kokoschka review, was there any local coverage? Simon? Well, the Leicester Mercury had yeah. published an article uh, just before the opening of the exhibition, um, which talked about Trevor Thomas banging uh, a great big drum mm. to uh, alert and to encourage people to come to the museum. I think this was really in, in response to the cycle of uh, exhibitions which he'd introduced um in the run-up to the 1944 show so so um i think certainly uh trevor thomas's activities um if you consider the the context of all those all those exhibitions um as as a distinct set then he he was certainly working very hard to to offer um activities on a variety of topics um to attract people to uh to the museum um Again, um, sadly, and I have to say sadly, there, there's only a, 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 a minimum of um, uh, documentation uh, in terms of press response to the 1944 uh, exhibition. But um, again, uh, we know that uh, in certainly subsequently, um, you know, it, it was it was recognised and, and um, uh, later uh, formally, the aspect of collecting uh, German expressionism was was built into the collecting policy of the museum. 
And that's a good point at which I think perhaps to conclude, it is a fantastic collection and I am very curious to know how many of you have indeed been there in person. If you haven't, I would urge you to go without delay. Um, I will perhaps just actually put in a, a small plug for a tour that I myself am leading in early July. It's the 9th and the 10th of July. It's under the auspices of Jewish Renaissance magazine. And we're going, first of all, to Warsaw, which is also one of these kind of well-kept secrets in the British art world, where which uh, houses the most again, world-class collection of work, mostly centred on the life and work and indeed collecting activities of Jacob Epstein, another major sort of Jewish figure. And then on the 10th, we actually go to uh, to Leicester and Simon here will be, we'll have the pleasure of having Simon taking us around the, the collection. So if you're interested, if you just go to Jewish Renaissance magazine and uh, type in, we've called it Modern Art in the Midlands, I think, Modernism? No, Modern Art in the Midlands and find out more. I believe there's still some places uh, available. Good, and uh, just, Really to conclude, obviously with many, many thanks to both of you, also to our audience, and to say that uh, there were actually quite a few, as ever, more people signed up than have actually attended for whatever reason, but we have been recording the uh, session and it will be available in the next few days or so on the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel. And also, finally, finally, if you would like to sign up for the newsletter to be kept informed of our future programmes over the next months, uh, please do so. Go to insidersoutsidersfestival.org and at the bottom right of the, if you scroll right down to the homepage, you can sign up in you know, two, two minutes to, uh, to receive our newsletters good thank you that was fascinating and as ever you know raising as many sort of uh, questions as answers but that's 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 good that's good thank you so much both of you and all the best everyone thank you monica thank you, thank you. okay all the best bye bye